Hi, everybody. Welcome. Hope you're excited for a great day. This is the, uh, the kickoff session for the 2023 Sabre Analytics Conference. My name is Scott Carter. I am Sabre's Executive Vice President, and I'm thrilled that you are joining us today for student programming as we kick off this year's event. Um, this year, we're welcoming nearly 600 students from across the country as Sabre continues to be a conduit between the baseball industry and those looking to join it. Um, a few housekeeping notes before we get started with today's first presenter. Um, one, all programming sessions, uh, including the general sessions beginning tomorrow, will be recorded and made available to uh, attendees after the event. So if you miss a session, don't worry. We'll send out an email after we have a chance to put all the videos together uh, after the event and, and get those to you so you can watch them back um, even if you miss one. Um, at the end of today's program, we're going to be hosting a virtual networking session um, here in the same meeting. So uh, don't close this meeting. You can stay logged in all day. Um, this is going to be a great way for you to meet some of your peers and grow your network within the game. Um, I can speak from experience that baseball is an extremely small world. Um, so you never know when you'll cross paths with someone you meet today. Um, even if they're a peer from across the country, you may remember a name and, and you may find yourself working for the same club or the same, um, you know, the same company down the road. So just, just remember that um, you might meet some of these people down the line. So uh, make some connections today. That's, that's would be my suggestion to take away from this. Um, when the conference is over, you're going to receive an email um, with several opportunities to continue your professional growth. First, you're going to receive a complimentary stat head membership from our friends at Baseball Reference. Um, the stat head membership is, is the most powerful data search tool out there and it'll bring a lot of enjoyment to your fan experience this season. Um, secondly, you're going to receive access to a complimentary certification course from Rapsodo. I know everybody um, appreciates that particular piece of it and we will send you access to that course after the event, I know I get a lot of emails asking, when do I get the Rapsodo course? It'll be after the conference, you'll, you'll receive an access code and a link to get your Rapsodo certification um, course. Finally, um, Sabre has also really released uh, its own analytics certification program. Um, please check that out when you have some time today or over the weekend. Um, most of you are Sabre members now. And as a Sabre member, you get a fantastic discount on all Sabre analytics certification programs. The first level, which is our introductory course, is available now. The second course, which is advanced analytics in baseball, and it's going to be taught by Ben Jedlovic with Major League Baseball, will it be available here in the next few weeks. Um, so I highly suggest you checking that out. Um, they're fantastic courses. And again, something great to put on your resume and help you separate from other applicants as you move throughout your career. Okay, let's talk about today's session. We've got five skill acquisitions present skill acquisition presentations lined up for you today, each designed to help you work with baseball data. After these presentations, we'll take a break and then we'll return with the networking session, like I said, to conclude today's student programming. Um, today's first presentation is Sean Lehman. Sean is the creator of the Lehman Baseball Database, an open source collection of baseball statistics. Um, Sean has been a contributor and an editor for more than a dozen sports reference books and serves as the data projects manager for Sabre. Today, he'll be providing us with an introduction to baseball databases. Sean, my friend, the floor is yours. Thanks, Scott. And hello, everyone. Uh, this is going to be uh, fun today, I, I hope, for all of us. Um, this session is an introduction to uh, baseball databases using SQL. It's really meant to be an introductory conversation aimed at folks who maybe have dabbled with databases a little bit or even if you haven't worked with them at all, that's fine. And I, I hope that uh, what we talk about today can serve as a, a jumping off point for you to do a lot more. Um, I'm going to share my screen now, but let me just echo um, what Scott said about networking and how important that is um, and invite you to um, follow me on Twitter or other platforms or um, email me anytime if you have questions that come up um, after the session is done or any time in the future, I'd be happy to uh, happy to help and, and talk to you. So I'm going to give you um, 
an overview of some important concepts, and then we'll walk through a bunch of examples. Um, the goal um, today is to give you the resources that you need to get started uh, working with databases on your own and to move forward uh, developing some more advanced skills. Uh, we'll be using Microsoft Access with the Layman Baseball Database. Uh, if you want to follow along at home, you certainly can. This link will point you towards a, a page where you can download that database uh, for free. Uh, but if you prefer to just watch along, that's okay too. We're going to focus on some, some broad concepts today. So let's start by talking a little bit about what a database is. Uh, most folks will say it's a collection of data, but that's, that's not entirely correct. A, a database is a way of organizing that data uh, specifically to make it easier to analyze and extract meaningful information. When we create a database, what we're doing is creating a set of rules that will govern how data is collected and, and how it's stored. And these rules are what make complex analysis possible. One of the most common ways of working with data is spreadsheets. Uh, and you may be familiar with uh, Microsoft Excel or Google Docs as examples of that. And for many purposes, um, spreadsheets are, are, you know, they're adequate, an adequate tool for doing that. You can make manual entries. There's no need for really strict rules. And you can use the basic tools of, this, of the spreadsheet to sort by year and see who the most recent World Series winners were or to find out how many times each team has won a, a championship. Spreadsheets are, are good for simple lists and, and helping to an answer simple questions, but you need a database to do more complicated analysis and to work with large collections of data. So what if we wanted to ask some more complex questions, like say, looking at the correlation between how many uh, team, how many wins a team gets in a season and the likelihood they'll, they'll get to the World Series, or how many teams led the league in home runs but failed to make the playoffs. These sets of questions require a more complex set of data, and they require tools that don't really um, exist in spreadsheets. So to answer those sorts of questions, what database folks call queries, you need to create a structured database and work with what we call a, a DBMS or a database management system to make uh, those queries. And we make those queries using a form of computer code called SQL or structured query language. We're going to walk through the basics of SQL today, but what's most important, I think, is that you understand the underlying concepts. The specific syntax of SQL will become easier as you spend more time working with databases. But if you understand the fundamental ideas and what we're trying to accomplish, um, the rest will be easier. So for the purposes of this session, we're going to work with Microsoft Access. Now, Access is not the best database tool, but um, it, it has a lot of limitations. But for learning purposes, it does have a couple of distinct advantages. And the first is that it's readily available. It comes as part of Microsoft Office. So anyone working in a professional setting or in an academic setting likely has it available. For more robust analysis, you would need to start by installing a series of tools and then learning a programming language like Python or R. And you have to do all of that just to get started. But if you have access, all you have to do is click the icon and you're ready to get your hands dirty and dig into a database. Uh, and the second thing uh, about access that I think is helpful is that it has a visual interface that makes it easy to explore a complex database. It has drag and drop tools for building queries. And you can use it without ever having to learn SQL code, how to write it or how it works. Um, and better still, I think the tool will help you learn about SQL by building queries for you um, and showing you how that works. So I'm going to start by explaining some of the basic concepts of how we, we build a database. And I'm going to go through these ideas once quickly, and then we'll dive in and, and see them in action. So we talked about rules for databases and that you need them to perform complex queries. Well, what are those rules? If you recall, when we talk about spreadsheets, you're simply organizing them into rows and columns. A data table is a similar structure within a database where each column is what we call a field and each row is what we call a record. 
But each of those fields have rules, uh, and the most important of which is to define a data type. So a field can contain a string of text, it can be a number, it can be a date. And of course, you can get even more complex in defining each of those data types. So a string can have a variable length, for example, um, someone's last name, or it could be a fixed length, like the team and league abbreviations or their defensive position. And a number can be an integer, like the number of hits, or it can be a decimal, um, like batting average. Another rule that we, uh, we use to define is whether a value is required or not. If we have a list of players, for example, we might require that each of them have a first name and a last name. Um, but not every player will have a nickname, for example, and people who are alive won't have a, a date of death. Um, another important rule in creating something called a key, and that's a field that helps us to group similar records together and distinguish unique records from each other. So one example might be the three letter abbreviations we use for each team. Uh, in some tables, such as a listing, just a list of who all the teams are, um, that key might be unique. But in other cases, like in a table of batting statistics, the key might appear dozens of times. Keys also help us distinguish players or teams who have the same name, but are in fact different. So the Frank Thomas who played in the 90s for the White Sox um, has a different unique key than the Frank Thomas who played for the Mets in the 1960s. There's so lots of players that have the same name. The key here is, is this, that the purpose of the keys is to help us connect these different tables together and that's what help us, helps us to organize um, the data. The concepts I think will become a little more clear as we dive in, uh, but for now, just remember, we are gonna organize our data into tables, we're gonna define data types, and we're gonna create keys to help link those tables together. So let's take a, a, a look at the Lehman Baseball Database and how it's constructed. And we should start with, I think, a quick discussion about the scope of the database. Um, of all the publicly available uh, baseball databases, this one is at the highest level. And what I mean by that is it's like a satellite view that's giving us a very high level view of player development. Um, for players and teams, it has season by season totals. In other words, there's one record for each player season, like you would see at, at Baseball Reference, for example. If you're interested in looking at game by game or play by play data, uh, you know, a, a more granular scope, um, you'd want to look at something like the RetroSheet database. And if you want to look at, say, pitch by pitch data, you know, something like Baseball Savant. Scope is an important concept. If you want to know, say, how many times uh, Joey Votto got a walk on four pitches or how many times a Roldis Chapman plunked somebody with a hundred mile per hour fastball, you're not going to find it here. And likewise, if you wanted to know how many times Mike Trout has been intentionally walked, it's going to be a whole lot harder to try to answer that question from play by play or pitch by pitch databases. So understanding the scope of your database uh, is important. This is a, um, a visual representation of what's in the, in the Lehman baseball database. Each one of these boxes is a data table. There's 27 of them. And the lines between them show how each one of them is linked to others through the use of keys. We'll look at some of these tables in more depth, but let me just talk by, uh, start by talking about them very, very broadly. Um, we're not gonna get too deep into the principles of database design, but generally what we try to do is organize data into tables in a way that eliminates the need for it to appear in multiple places. So for example, we know I mentioned Joey Votto, we know he's a left-handed batter. We wanna store that information only one time in one place. We don't need to make a record of his left-handedness on every single record that pertains to him. And so all of the information that's unique to Votto and to all of the other players is stored in this table up at the top here called people. It's got uh, the date and place of birth and height, weight, full name, things like that. And the people table is one of the most important ones in this database. You can see that there's a unique key called player ID, uh, player ID that we assign to each player. And that links to almost all the other tables. I'll take a real 
quick rundown of, of what some of these tables are. The main statistical tables are here, and they're probably what you would expect. Uh, separate tables for batting, pitching, and fielding statistics. Um, you'll notice there are separate tables that have postseason data, batting, pitching, and fielding again. And why do we do that? Well, so you can uh, write a query that asks who hit the most home runs in the World Series, for example. We have a couple of extra tables for fielding statistics here. Before uh, 1955, the official statistics lumped all three outfield positions into a single category. A guy like Babe Ruth played left and center and right, but the official statistics clumped that all together just as outfield. So uh, this table, fielding outfield here, um, has a breakout of how many games each outfielder played broken out by left, right, and center. Uh, the fielding outfield split tables has some more advanced fielding data for outfielders uh, from 1955 to the present that we derived from retro sheet game data. I could do a whole hour talking about fielding data, but I, I don't want to get sidetracked too much. Um, there's some complexities to the fielding data. One more table here is called appearances, and um, that tracks how many times a player appeared at each position. A lot of that's in the fielding tables, of course, but um, this also includes how many times they appeared as a designated hitter or a pinch runner or a pinch hitter. We have a separate table for managers, which has their year-by-year -year managerial records. And just as with all the tables for players, each one here has a corresponding record in the people table with their full name and their birth date and so on. So the people table is a pretty important one because of everything that's related to it. The same is true of this teams table, which contains year by year data for each team, their one loss record, uh, team totals for batting and pitching and their place in the final standings and so on. There's four tables that live underneath of that um, that have additional data that's related to each team. Teams franchises is how we keep track of teams as they move or change their names. It's how we know that the California Angels and Los Angeles Angels are part of the same franchise or the Seattle Pilots and the Milwaukee Brewers. This home games tra uh, table um, tracks how many games each team played in a given season. We have a lot of games nowadays that are played at neutral sites for a variety of reasons. Uh, and that's how we keep track of that. The parks table here has um, more details about each one of those those stadiums, it's one of the things that helps us keep up with the, the stadiums that have changed their names 11 times. Um, and last but not least, the series post, uh, which is just postseason series, has details on every playoff series, which team won, which team lost, pretty straightforward. So those are 16 tables that are the core of the database. Um, there's a few supplemental tables. I'll talk about those real quick. Um, we have a Hall of Fame table over here that um, has vote totals for each year's Hall of Fame ballot. That's a quick way to look up whether somebody's a Hall of Famer or not. Um, the All-Star table um, has data on every player selected for an All-Star game, whether they played in the game or not, whether they were a starter. Um, salaries is an admittedly incomplete uh, collection of annual player salaries that's based on uh, data that's been made public. There are four separate tables for awards. Manager awards and player awards are stored separately. Uh, this uh, awards players and awards managers is, is simply lists of who won the awards each year. And then down here, award shares, uh, those are voting breakdowns. So you'd use the uh, awards players to find out, say, how many Yankees players have won an MVP award. And the award share players, you could see how many Yankees have gotten votes for MVP. Um, there's another data table up here called college playing. That's a list of which colleges a ball player might have played for. It's one record for each season. Um, no playing statistics here. It's really just about where and when uh, guys played college ball. And the table called schools um, has more details on each college team, like the name of the school um, and where it's located. And I should mention, just for the sake of completeness, two more down here that are really not used that much. Uh, managers halves and teams half. They're related to split seasons, which have uh, been more common in the minor leagues than in the majors. 
it's only happened twice during the strike shortened season in 81 and um, also in 1892 for some strange reasons. But um, these tables have first and second half uh, win loss records for, for teams and managers. So I want to switch over to access now so we can um, we can take a closer look at, at how all of this this works in action and give us a chance to explore some of the rules that we talked about before. Um, data types and, and null values, things like that will make more sense when you see them in practice. So in access over here on the left is a list of all of the tables um, that exist and uh, you just click on one to see what's inside of it. So we'll start with the, the people table. When we talked about um, data types, we talked about how you can define a field as a date, but you'll notice that we stored birth date as, as three separate fields here. And why do we do that? It's because for some players like, uh, let's see, like this guy right here, we don't know when he was born. There have been about 20,000 players in Major League history, more than that, I think. Uh, but there's a lot from the 19th century, um, for example, that we just don't know when they were born. Um, we have a death date here. Uh, when there's not a death date listed, that means a player is, is still alive. Um, let me scroll over here a little bit. We also have a, a field called debut. Um, and final game, which is, as it says, when the guy made his first appearance in the major leagues, when he made his last, um, that's stored as, as a date because we know the exact date um, from box scores when that happened. Um, and I'll note here that since our scope is year by year, we update this database at the end of every year. And so the final game field is updated as well. Of course, that doesn't mean that this guy is not going to play again. It just means that through last season, uh, that was the last time that he played. Um, let's see. In this country, we usually express height and weight in, uh, we express height in feet and inches, but um, that gets tricky. If you store that as a string, say 6-2, um, then you can't perform mathematical functions on the value. And if it's a string, uh, you can't do a query to say, ask for the most home runs by a player under 6'2 or over 6'2. Uh, so we convert that value to inches. Um, and I'll note one more thing here, which is that for every player, we have not only this key called player ID that we've talked about that matches records to a player within the database, but we have IDs that will let you match them to um, their records in RetroSheet or Baseball Reference. So let's open the let's open the batting table now. This is all the batting statistics. Um, you can see down here at the bottom is a lot. A lot of uh, a lot of players have played in the major leagues. Um, most of these categories are should be familiar to you and self-explanatory. Um, I'll talk about a couple that aren't. The stint field here is an important one, um, and that simply tells you. When a player played for more than one teams in a season, that tells you what order those appearances occurred in, which can be important for all sorts of reasons. When you look at some of these records for 19th century players, you'll see that there's gaps here. Uh, some of the fields are blank. In the 19th century, they didn't track things like uh, hit by pitch or sacrifices. We've talked about rules. Um, and it's important in cases like this to know whether, to know the difference between a guy getting hit by a pitch zero times and a guy, we just don't know how many times he got hit by a pitch, what we call a null value. Um, caught stealing is another good example. We didn't have complete data on that until about 1920. So um, it's important to know that that these guys here who had 20 or 30 steals, we don't know how many times they got caught. So you can't really do a, a calculate stolen base percentage, for example. There's other examples of, of missing data in here, which you'll see <clears throat> as you explore a little more. Let me pop open the, uh, the pitching table. We'll take a quick look at that. And again, just click on it and it comes up. 
And again, if you look at this, you'll see that some of these categories, when we go back in time, there's going to be blanks there. Um, we talked about how in the people table that uh, we convert the height field to inches. So I want you to take note here that we do the same thing with innings pitched. Uh, baseball has been wildly inconsistent with how it expresses fractions of an inning uh, in its official records. There have been times when they just round it down. Um, sometimes if a guy pitches, say, eight in the third innings, um, that's expressed as 8.1, sometimes 8.3. Sometimes they'll use the fraction symbol. And any of those methods are fine for displaying in a box score, but you can't do math that way. So if a pitcher goes eight and a third innings and then has another outing that lasts just two thirds, that's 8.1 plus 0 0.2 equals 8.3. That's not right. So the solution here is to store innings pitched as outs. So one inning is three IP outs. Um, that'll avoid the rounding errors and it's easy to convert that back to innings when you display your results or if you wanna calculate uh, earned run average. Those are just a few examples of the kinds of rules uh, that make a database like this function. I'm not gonna go through all 27 of these tables, but as you uh, explore, you'll come across uh, more examples. I should note there's a readme file data, uh, that comes when you download this database that explains what each table is, explains what each of the fields are, uh, in case the abbreviations aren't always clear. It's what we call a data dictionary. And that's a great place to start uh, when you're working with this database uh, or any other. So we're gonna start by looking at one of these tables and building some, some simple queries to give you an idea of how this works. Let's open up the, uh, close this and we'll open up the teams table, um, which we talked about that has for each team, uh, statistics, one loss record, batting, pitching, all of that good stuff in there. Each record has information on a single team season. As you see, there's a lot of information about each, each team season. Access calls this the data sheet view, and it's just a peek at the raw data. If we go to the home menu and we up here and we click and we change to design view, you can see the underlying structure, the rules that have been put in place. The field names are usually self-explanatory and you can see that each one has a data type defined. Year is a number, league and team ideas are each text strings. And if you can click on each one, you'll see down below um, a little more detail. The league abbreviation is a field size of two, for example, the team ID is three and so on. Understanding these underlying rules helps you to understand how to build queries. Uh, so let's start with the simple one. We, we showed that spreadsheet, which had a list of World Series winners. Um, I'm gonna go back to, uh, back to my slideshow for just a second. And we'll talk about um, what SQL queries look like. Typically a query is gonna have three or four parts and maybe more. The first thing you need to do is understand which fields you want to see in your results. You can look at all sorts of things, but we're interested in uh, the name of each World Series winner and, and which year they won. So to build a query with that, we'll start by selecting those two fields. Then we need to specify what data table we need to answer a question. We're not going to get a list of World Series winning teams from the batting stats. It's going to come from the, the teams table. So in SQL, that's what we call a from statement. But we don't want a list of every team, just the teams that won the World Series each season. And conveniently, there's a, a field that tells that. We only want the records where a field returns a particular value, in this case, a, a yes in the World Series winner field. And for ease of reading, we can decide to sort our results in a certain order. So in this case, we'll sort, we can sort them in descending order, order by year, so that the most recent ones are at the top of our list. So I'm gonna switch back to access now. Let me close this. Um, and we'll build a query using the drag and drop tools. Let me actually shouldn't have closed that. Here's the, the teams table. Well, we could close that. Well, we're gonna build a query uh, by going up here under create. 
and query design. So the first thing we're going to do is our from. We need to decide what table we want to query. We're going to do the Teams table. So we just drag that in there like that. You can either drag and drop it, or you can uh, just double click. That's up to you. And then we'll drag and the, drop the fields we want to select. So in this case, we want the year, and we want the team. And we go down here in our thing, we will see World Series winner, which we do want. Um, we're going to go down here to criteria. Um, and we're going to set that to why we want a list of teams that have a yes for winning the World Series. And we're going to order that by year. Let's do it in descending order. So we get the most recent ones. And we go up here to our view, click on data sheet view, and there's our list of, of World Series winners. Now you can do that all with the drag and drop. It's a good way to get started. Uh, but if you want to see what the underlying SQL code looks like, you go back to your view and change that. And you see that Access has created this query for us. Uh, select, the select statement specifies the three fields we want to show in our results. The from specifies the table that we're going to query. Where, uh, tell SQL we only want records that match the criteria. In this case, uh, where the World Series win equals yes and uh, then the order by, which sorts this for us. So we'll go back and look at the list of results again. You see, that's how it does that query. But we can make this a little more complex. Let's, uh, let's make a query to find out, um, let's find out which teams have won the World Series with the fewest wins in the regular season. We'll go back to our design view here. We're gonna need to add a few uh, more fields to our select. Uh, let's add wins because that's what we want to know. But let's also add games to help give us a little context. Teams don't always play the same number of games every season historically. Um, we can get rid of the sort by year. And let's instead sort it by wins. And we're going to do an ascending sort because we want to see which team had the fewest wins and won the World Series. We'll just go back here to our data sheet view, and that'll give us the answer. And there you see the Dodgers have won two World Series in, in seasons that were shortened for different reasons, and then the 1918 Red Sox and so on. And again, you can go back to the SQL view. Uh, and see what the SQL code looks like. You see, we've added a few fields to our select statement. We changed our order by statement, but otherwise it's pretty much the same as before. Let's do, let's do one more here, change a few things. Let's go back to the design view and query for teams that did not win a World Series. And we see which ones had the most wins in a season and didn't win a World Series. All we're going to do is change that criteria in our where statement from yes to no. And let's change the sort order here because we want to see who had the most wins and didn't win a World Series. And there you have it, the 2001 Mariners um, who lost the ALCS to the Yankees and the 1906 Cubs who I believe beat uh, the White Sox that year. A couple of things I should mention here about working in Access before we, we move ahead. When you're running queries, you're almost always in a read-only mode. You can't accidentally overwrite the underlying data. So feel free to tinker around and create queries like this and then look at the SQL view. It's a great way to learn. You're not going to break anything. Um, let's, uh, let's go. You can go into the SQL code as well if you want to, and, and you can edit this. Uh, if you feel confident. Let's change the where so we're getting teams that won the World Series. Uh, and I'll just do that like so. And let's get rid of the let's get rid of the games field, which you would do, say, just by doing that. 
this will give us a list of the World Series winners, uh, World Series winners who won the most regular season games. And there you go. The 1998 Yankees are at the top of the list. If you make a mistake in writing the SQL code, um, let's say you put in a field that doesn't exi exist, then you'll get an error message that looks like that, has no idea what you're talking about. Um, that's, that's what makes a visual tool so helpful when you're learning. Um, there you go. I want to get into uh, something a little more complex now. And uh, as a baseline, let's start with a simple query to give us a list of the most home run tables, uh, home run totals for a player in a, a single season. And the approach is, is generally the same as, as what we did for the list of World Series champions. We'll start a new query. We'll go up here to create and query design. And we'll select. Uh, the batting table, which is where it'll tell us home runs, right? We'll need, uh, let's see, we're going to need a player name. We're going to need what year. Uh, and uh, we're going to need home runs. Like so. And we want to sort by home runs because we want to know who had the most, right? And there you go. Um, Bonds, McGuire, so, so the names you know. Um, two quick notes about this. First of all, we're displaying the player ID here, which is a key and not their actual name. For this purpose, you probably are familiar with these names. You can decipher them. The key is uh, last name, first name, and then a number. So you could probably figure out that's Barry Bonds and Mark McGuire, but that's not always the case. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a, in a few minutes. The other thing is we didn't select any criteria, uh, criteria for our where statement. So as a result, this isn't just a top leaders list. It's literally the home run totals for every player, every season, uh, including all these folks who had zero home runs in a season. It's 112,000 records. Uh, since we're mostly interested in looking at the highest totals, you can create a where statement that puts a limit on that. It's a lot more efficient to return a shorter list. Um, and we already know how to do that. So let's go back and look at the design view. And we're going to put a criteria in here that says greater than equal to 50. And as you see, that gives us a much more manageable list. Uh, 46 guys who hit 50 home runs in a season. And let me mention one thing here about the visual editor. Since we're looking at this, you can change things like the, the sort order just by clicking on this dev, uh, design view. So let's click on the column um, header to sort these by year. If you want to take a look at the order in which guys joined the 50 home run club, you can also drag and drop the totals to uh, the columns to make this more readable. So let's say put those home run totals all the way over at the left. This is a this is the kind of query you might do often in a relational database. Um, another one might be, what if instead of looking at single season leaders, you wanted to look at career leaders and home runs? Um, the batting table has a list of, as you remember, it's season by season totals for every player. So we're gonna have to group them together. I'm gonna show you how to do that right now. So we go back to our, our design. Uh, we're going to click up here on the query design menu where it says totals. That's going to let us do some, some mathematical operations on this rather than just displaying the records as they are. Um, it just, when you click on this, it toggles that field. You see where it says total? Just toggles that off and on. It's off by default. And this is where having strict rules in place really helps. We want to group by player, group by there. Um, and because the player IDs are unique, every record for Barry Bonds, every record for Mike Trout are going to get grouped together. Um, we want to look at their entire career, not individual seasons. So we get rid of that year field. And what we want is, is the total of all their home runs, right? So 
not going to group it by home runs. We want the sum. You can see here there's all kinds of uh, uh, mathematical functions you can perform here. You can get the max if you want to see what's the most home runs a player ever hit in a season, what's the least, um, what's the average. But for this, we're going to do sum, right? Um, so let's look at the data sheet view and see if this makes any sense. And there you go. Bonds, Aaron, Ruth, Pujols, and so on. So we'll go back real quick and we'll take a look at the SQL statement to kind of get a sense for, for what this is. It's, it's very similar to what we've done before. The big difference is that we have a, a group by statement, which tells access we want to group them by uh, player ID. You get one result for every player ID that's in the batting table. And when we're, we're grouping these, um, our where statement be access calls having. So in this case, it carried over um, our limit of at least 50 home runs, career home runs from the earlier query. You'll notice in our select field, we've told access that we want to see the player ID and a sum of each player's yearly home run totals. There's an as statement up here. It's going to take the sum of batting home, home runs and it's going to call that sum of home runs. You can call that anything else. Let's just call it career homers. It'll even carry over your typo. So there you go. It shouldn't take you very long to become proficient at building these kinds of simple queries in Access when you're working um, with one table at a time. But let's take a look at how you can query multiple tables at the same time. And this is really where you're going to see the, the difference between uh, working in a, a spreadsheet and working in a relational database. Um, let's go back and take a look at our, our people table. Um, and you can take a, a peek at that just by clicking at it here, right? This table has all kinds of information about each player. Um, we have their name, their height, their weight. Um, so if we wanted to display any of that information or even just their name in our list of home run leaders, um, or maybe if we want to see who's the leader among active players or players born in the state of California, you can do that by querying the batting table and the people table at the same time. And we can do that because we have this key called player ID that exists in both tables and allows us to join the tables together. And joining tables is an important part of building some really complex queries. So let's go back to our this query we've got going here. We'll look at the, the query design and we're gonna add that people table just by clicking it and dragging it over to our workspace like that. Access knows how these tables are linked, how they're related to each other, because that's one of the rules we've already defined. This little line shows the link from player ID in the people table to player ID in the batting table. So we can just drag and drop the player names, last name, first name, like that, go look at our view, and there you have it. It's much easier to read, obviously. Again, let's go and take a quick look at the SQL view. And hopefully this is starting to get a little familiar for you. Notice in the second line, we have a new statement called inner join. And this tells the database engine that you want to do a query against two tables and link them um, on a, a key that exists in each one. In this case, making the player ID in the people table linked to the player ID in the batting table. So going back to what I said at the outset, this type of query is only possible because we put rules in place. We created keys and we know that there's a corresponding record in the people table for every record that exists in the batting table. Let's put another spin on this. Let's change our query so that we can see which of these hitters was a, a righty or a lefty or a switch hitter. So we do that. Let's go back to the design view. We're going to add the bats field to our query from the people uh, table. And then we're gonna use, let's look for who are the leading career 
uh, home run hitters who are left-handed, which is just L in our data table. And we go back to our data sheet view. And there you go. There's there's the list of most career home runs by a lefty. And if you want to say, look at switch hitters. And in, uh, in this database, we use B for that abbreviation. That's both. And there you go. Maybe you're interested in a list of um, sluggers who are still active. Uh, let's add another filter to give us players who played in 2022. That's how we define active, I guess. So year ID, we're going to change that to 2022, but we don't want just a list of who hit the most home runs in 2022. What we want is players whose maximum year is equal to 2022. We'll get rid of the switch hitters. Who's got the most home runs among players who were active last year? There you go. Our good friend, Albert Pujols. So what we're, what we're demonstrating here is the power of what we call a relational database. Um, and the, the important thing that I hope you can take away from today is understanding that the, the power of this kind of database comes from the fact that the data is very well organized, in this case, into 27 uh, different tables. And because we've defined rules and created keys, we can begin to do all sorts of, of complex queries. Um, we're coming up on the top of the hour. So I think what I'd like to do is take a look. I see some folks have posted uh, questions in the chat or in the Q&A feature. If you have questions, please do that. And of course, um, we're going to run out of time. So feel free, please, to follow up with me. Um, if you have more questions, as I said, you can find me on Twitter. You can send me an email. I'm happy to uh, chat with you anytime about working with baseball data. Um, let me, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here, I think. And um, if I can figure out how to do that, and then I'll start uh, I start answering some of these questions. Um, let's see, Gavrielle Salas says, how do you download the Layman database and how do we download it into Access? Um, you can go to my website, which is seanlayman.com. If you can't remember how to spell that, you can just search on download baseball database and you'll probably find it. Um, let me, um, well, I won't, I won't demonstrate that for you live, but if you go there, um, you can download the database. It's already in access format and all you have to do is download it. If you have access, then all you have to do is click on the icon, uh, and you can start working with it. Um, the raw data is also available in, uh, comma separated variable files. And there's a link to that there. If you want to pull this into, um, another database uh, system, or if you want to just work with the raw data, that's there. There's a link to the GitHub where the, the raw data exists. Um, let's see, I have another question here. Um, let's see, Zeniap says, I work on several papers using baseball data as empirical context. One of the professors I work with has scraped some of the data from baseball reference, is there a way to obtain that data without scraping it? Well, yeah, most of that data uh, is in the Lehman Baseball database. Um, it's all there, um, does not include minor league data. We haven't added, uh, again, this is season by season data. So um, baseball reference has game by game, game data, which um, is not available in the Lehman Baseball database, but it is available from RetroSheet. Uh, we could spend hours talking about that, but retrosheet.org, you can download that data uh, either in raw files or uh, in a variety of formats um, there. And and uh, that's a great resource. Just like with my database, um, that's updated at the end of every season. Um, so if you're looking to do in-season analysis, that's, uh, that's going to be tougher, but um, 
that's where you go for that. And really, if you're using large, I know that Sean Foreman is very kind at baseball reference and lets people um, download data or scrape it, but that gets to be a pretty intensive way of doing that. And again, all of that raw data is available uh, in the Lehman Baseball database or in other formats. I should mention that um, if you're a, a more sophisticated user and you like to work in uh, R, for example, there are libraries out there that already exist that have this data in that format or a variety of others. Um, if you can't find them by searching, um, shoot me an email and I'll be happy to help you out. There's a, a very robust community, for example, of, of developers who like to work in R, who not only can help you find the raw data, uh, but can share with you uh, tools that they've built to do a lot of, a lot of things so you're not uh, starting from scratch uh, and reinventing the wheel. Um, Joseph Scioli asked a good question. He says the drop and uh, drag and drop design view seems like a great tool, especially for beginners. Yes, it is. And like I said, you can use that to learn the SQL code or you don't ever have to learn SQL if you just want to run some basic queries here. Are there any limitations to access uh, we should be wary of when starting out? I would just say a couple of things. Um, Microsoft Access does have some size limitations. So if you want to do, um, if you're working with say pitch by pitch data, if you're working with the pitch FX data, very large data sets, uh, you may run into some complexities trying to import that uh, into Access. Um, and there's not much, there's not really a way around that. Some of the very complex data sets really are gonna require that you learn uh, some programming skills. There's no way around that. Some other limitations, uh, all of the Microsoft products, whether it's Access or Excel, do not handle dates before 1900, um, which is unfortunate when you're doing baseball analysis since baseball began before 1900. So that's something that you really should be aware of. Um, here's a good question from Max Gordon. For someone who has very little data, uh, database experience, which platform do you recommend we learn for, uh, first? SQL, R, Python, Access, et cetera. Um, SQL, is gonna, SQL is really a building block for working in those other um, platforms, R or Python. Um, if you don't want to learn any of that, you can just do these kinds of queries in Access. Um, if you're gonna do something more complex, it's R or Python. Um, I think the baseball world is is fairly divided among those two platforms, really. Um, they're very similar uh, in terms of a learning curve, I think. There are, as I said, pretty robust uh, communities of people out there who work in those things. Um, and so um, I, I, you can't really, I can't really recommend one or the other, other than to just say they're both good platforms and um, you can find people to help you get started. Um, let's see, Peter Cully, we'll get through a few more here. Do you have to update the database by hand every year or is there a way to automate the process? Um, none of this is updated by hand, uh, thankfully. Um, the baseball, uh, there's a group of us that started maybe 20 years ago. Uh, it was Sean Foreman and myself and Ted Tarosi. Um, Ted is uh, a longtime uh, Sabre guy who has written a series of scripts that build most of these, uh, uh, the updates to these data tables from the play-by-play -play data every year. Um, it happens all automatically. Um, and I would recommend to you, if you're interested in uh, learning more about that, uh, his stuff is on the web as the Chadwick Baseball Bureau. And um, I've got links to that at my website. Uh, he also has not only uh, raw data, but a lot of, of uh, uh, code scripts on GitHub that you can uh, borrow or steal. Um, let's see, Matthew asks, is there a database like this for the minor leagues? Uh, the short answer is no. There, is, uh, there are some minor league data sets out there, but nothing that's um, publicly available. Um, let's see, there's a lot more questions here. I know we're gonna run out of time. I will try to answer those uh, in the chat if I can, but let me just uh, wrap up by saying what I said at the outset, which is feel free to email me if you have any questions, reach out to me on 
Twitter or LinkedIn or I suppose Instagram, although that'd be kind of weird. Uh, but get in touch with me. I'm happy to help answer any questions that you have as you uh, start your process process of exploring baseball data. And uh, there are some fantastic groups, um, many of which are part of Sabre. But as you go into your networking today, I think you'll find that the community of people who work with baseball data, uh, as Scott said at the outset, is is not so large as you would imagine. It's a pretty tight knit group. Uh, and we're all here to help each other learn, uh, not just about these complex things like coding, but ultimately to learn more about baseball and to uh, to add value to the, the baseball world by doing that. So uh, we'll leave it at that. Thank you, everybody. Good luck with the rest of your day. I know you got a lot more uh, interesting things to talk about. And uh, as I said, feel free to reach out to me anytime. Awesome, Sean, wonderful work again. Um, we are always appreciative of you joining us um, and kicking our student programming off.